long-standing relationships, both historic and modern, with the territories upon which we are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that our watershed forms a part of the treaty and traditional territory of the southeastern Anishinaabeg. It is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we live and work. To honor this legacy, we commit to being stewards of the natural environment and undertake to have a relationship of respect with our treaty partners. Okay, so we're gonna start with adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda, please? Peter and Tracy, all in favor, carried. Okay, any declarations of pecuniary interest? None seen. And uh, can I get a, a motion to approve uh, the previous uh, meeting's uh, minutes? Kriya? Terry, <laughs> all in favor, any questions? No, nope. all in favor, okay. There business arising from the minutes? None seen. We have no deputations. So we're on to number six, 6.1, information technology. Warren Dodd, network analyst and administrator. Hello, board, directors. All right. Yeah. So feel free to ask uh, questions during this presentation. It's, it's fairly general to the measure, um, but uh, I'll answer questions as best as I can and any along the way. So, so uh, my name is Warren Dodd. I'm the network analyst and administrator. Um, there you go. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been here since September 2020, 22, and uh, we've done a lot of initiatives since then. Um, previously, I had worked at large corporations as a as a consultant and contractor, and it was really a nice change to come to a smaller uh, business like this to work for. Okay, introduction. Uh, we're going we're just gonna be doing the recent accomplishments, the priorities for 2024 and long-term strategies. Um, we've uh, discussed this right here. And uh, recent accomplishments. Okay, so we've done account security improvements, uh, so things such as removing admin rights and uh, uh, creating um, privilege accounts and things like that to, just to improve our security. We've also done security improvements on Microsoft 365 as well. Uh, we, we, we did a request system. Uh, we've completed 371 requests in 2023. We've increased our score in Microsoft 365 uh, through some security changes in that, and we have some upcoming initiatives that should significantly uh, increase it in the future. Um, we've done a lot along, along the way with uh, user education. We've done some presentation. We do phishing tests. We do, uh, uh, you know, um, education, any, any opportunity that there is um, that, that we can to increase our security. Um, we've uh, implemented a Wi-Fi system with a separate guest network. Previously, the guest network was together and wasn't really separated. We now have that logical separation, which cuts down our, our vulnerability quite a bit. We've also implemented encryption of devices, in particular, uh, especially for laptops and that, if they get lost out in the field, um, that data cannot be pulled off these devices. That's a very important change we made. Um, reduced organizational risk through policy, enha policy enhancements, uh, we won't go into detail on that. Um, we've done our regular, we do regular phishing tests and we've also implemented uh, vulnerability scanning and mitigation. Um, so in infrastructure, uh, wireless upgrades, you're probably all aware of that. Uh, there was 
a lot of wireless issues when we first when I first came here, and we've um, we've uh, added five access points and and added uh, coverage out to the outbuildings as well. Uh, the audio video system, this is all all new uh, that we put in. Uh, improve the connectivity for the projectors. Uh, we did have, they were all running wirelessly before and which caused a lot of issues. So we hardwired this in and, and added some other functionality as well. Uh, we've also uh, implemented stand-up stations, um, including a shared station uh, that people can use. Um, we've done several uh, server room improvements. The server room itself was extremely dusty and which was a fire risk to the servers and all that. So uh, we've put in a filtration system in there and it's significantly reduced the dusk and the risk. Uh, we strengthened backups and retention procedures. Uh, we've increased from weeks to years on retention and uh, we've also Done, we're, we've improved offsite backups and things like that. Um, and it was actually cheaper to do this than our previous um, way of doing things using the cloud. And uh, yes. Sorry, I want to throw you off your rhythm. Instead of the cloud, or I was going to ask about the cloud. Okay. But yeah. Previously, we were backup. using a, a, an external data center for backups. And that, a wireless link to that. No, no, that was through the internet. Okay. Uh, but it was to a third party provider. Yes. And uh, so they they had hardware that belonged to us at that site and that was being used um, for offsite backups. It's always good to have more than one place, yes. More than one place, yeah. And uh, in its place we we've gone to a cloud a cloud backup solution that actually saves a lot of costs and we've been able to add a lot of data to that. Do we still use paper anywhere? Like is that still a thing? We're, we're trying to, <laughs> I don't know, I guess John can answer that, but uh, yeah, we try to use paper as little as possible. And we're doing a lot of scanning of documents and, and things like that. And I didn't know it was still running an archive of things or not. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you want to elaborate further on that? I don't think that covers it. We have a <laughs> uh, more paperless um, model, and we have our offsites there as well. We have a hard copy on site as well. So just with a three-to-one methodology for yep. the backups implemented. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we've also used 5S, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, a methodology that was originally from Toyota system, manufacturing systems. And it, it was all about uh, um, cleaning and sorting and, and setting things in place and improving efficiency by not having clutter and things like that. So. Um, I've been extolling 5S and, and using it in everything that I did. And recently we, we went through and gathered up all the old hardware that was around here. There was hardware going back to the 2000s. And we uh, uh, standardized the wiping process with saving of certificates as proof and uh, disposing of those that hardware. Um, and we're ongoing purge of old data and things like that too, you know. Um, and clean up an organization of the server room. So we've standardized. To, I think uh, uh, I was going to on that note, please, through the chair. Yeah. Uh, well. I know our library is always looking for um, hardware stuff to, to teach students and whatever. And, and we're getting rid of stuff here that's outdated for us. Was that pushed off to? somebody else that might make use of it for a learning curve or? No, we actually uh, wiped it and uh, auctioned it off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, maybe an arrangement that can be made or something. No, no, I just, I just wonder if it was made to yeah. get it in use, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, we don't dispose of it, so, you know. No. It's, uh, yeah, we didn't have a good inventory. Uh, we went to we went to Windows 11. We had to do a full inventory, find out what what we have, where we are, and who's got what. And so we that was the first thing we did, and then we uh, upgrade standardized on Windows 11 as Windows 10 is Windows 10 is end of life in uh, 2005. So we're we're well on track with that. We've put most of uh, all our full time users are on Windows 11. We, we just have a few student computers that uh, aren't Windows 11 compatible, and we hope to address that this year. Um, so we've also come up with uh, standards as part of the 5S process. 
computer minimum standards, we were at uh, 512 gigabytes and 16 gigs with, of RAM, which uh, helps us move forward in the future. And we're, we're doing a refresh cycle after three years. <clears throat> we did have a lot of people using very old computers and, and now they, everybody's pretty well up to the standard now. Uh, we've gone with monitor standards as well. Um, and we got very good pricing by uh, buying it in bulk as well. And everybody uh, uses docking stations now. And uh, as mentioned, all computers are now encrypted as well. All right, so for this year, uh, we're, we're doing server replacements. Um, one is complete, the other one's about 50% done. So we anticipate that to be finished uh, in April. Uh, security system, we're working on a, an upgrade to our security system. Um, cell repeater, um, we're looking to do that here because we don't have very good cell coverage for company phones and, or, uh, and say the security system too. And device and app management improvements, uh, we're, we're moving towards uh, cloud-based solutions for that. And uh, we're also continuing to improve backup redundancy as well. Uh, there's a couple additional things we can do. We've, we've improved the backups quite a bit. There's a couple of additional things that we can do, which, which will be done this year. Oh. Uh, we're also gonna do a review of the telephony system. Uh, we're using GoTo now, and GoTo has a lot, seems to have a lot of support issues and, and it's not the most reliable. So uh, we're gonna be looking at other solutions <coughs> and uh, see if we can come up with something better and possibly something more cost-effective as well. Um, we need to do F, uh, infrastructure updates, uh, hopefully do them be, before too long. Um, migration to SharePoint is something we would like to do to reduce the uh, amount of files that are on site. Uh, SharePoint has a lot of additional security features that we can use, and uh, as well as accountability and things like that. And uh, so hopefully we'll get there. And uh, I've also been, uh, pushing forward on uh, helping out with the drone program. I'm a, a drone pilot from 2016. Uh, I have a, I got my advanced certification in uh, May last year. So I've, uh, I'll be able to help out quite a bit on this uh, drone program with support and, and training and things like that. And the drone program, what they can do, they can do like 3D mapping right now. We use a lot of lower res data from satellites and, and uh, um, LIDAR, and we can get high res data through through 3D data uh, from drones. Uh, I've also worked a lot on, on learning how to model and all that kind of stuff, and which I can pass on to others. And it can also be used for environmental modeling. You can watch, you can check environmental health or growth of plantations, all that kind of stuff. So hopefully that'll be a, a very useful new capability in the future. So that's all I've got. Anybody have any questions? Korea? Thank you through the chair. Um, so um, the drones, yes. will all the staff get, did I, maybe I missed you, will all the staff get trained or those suitable staff who need to get trained on how to use Yeah, we've them? got a very small group that, uh, that will be doing this, mostly from the IWM group. And- uh, Is that the integrated? Water. Watershed management, yep. Yeah, so yeah, so it's going to be a small group. Uh, they, we're working on the charter right now. And I'm part of that too as well. And, uh, yeah, hopefully get that home. Yeah. Great technology. Thank you. Yeah, it sure is. I, yeah. It's pretty fascinating when you can do, you know, fast as a, just to automate a drone to just clean up an area, and then you input the data in, in and process it, and they call it comes out with three D maps that are within. Like really? one inch resolution. Really? Yeah. I'd love to we see don't that. have any kind of data like that right now. So yeah. So you'll have those maps probably a, like a year from now or something. Yeah, I would say so. I don't know what's a time. I don't have. We don't have a timeline on this project yet. But yeah, uh, what we see it as is uh, part of our um, innovation as an organization, and I think there's lots of opportunities as Warren said to uh, to utilize that. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll do a couple pilots and kind of test it out in a couple of areas and uh, it'll be on a spot basis, I would say. 
uh, you know, as a project needs it uh, and there's uh, an ability to use it, then we'll be able to implement that. But the first step is getting the drones, the equipment that uh, enables that to, to happen, software, and, and of course, training. When you say it's just going to go up and down and up and down, is that something you program into the drone and then it does that work? Yes. Or you're not standing there. Yes, you have, you have, uh, it, it, works, it works very simple. So you'll have drone software that will show you a map of an area. You draw the map of the area and then you put the parameters such as the altitude that you want, and, you know, the, the speed, resolution, all that. And then when the drone goes up, it goes up and automatically does all, all its work. Line. Yeah, yeah, I've done it many times. I do it. I got personal drones at home that I did that all the time, and I found it easy to map, like map at high res, a hundred acres yeah. in less than an hour. That's how efficient it is. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it takes more time to process the data than it does to actually collect it. Yeah. Thank you. Tracy? Oh, great. great. Thank you, Theory Chair. Um, also, I was just thinking if we're moving to that, we'd love, I would love to see, you know, as a report back is showing us yeah. actually how it works because I know when I've seen drones, like you don't have that in, you're not disturbing the environment when you're doing that footprint up there, right? So it's mm -hmm. pretty incredible. And I know we'll use it for bylaw, right, to look at if someone's, you know, disturbed a wetland or farmers are using it now to check. <coughs> It's quite interesting to see how far it's evolving so quickly. Well, I, I actually did a presentation to our internally uh, on the drone capabilities not that long ago. Maybe I could represent that for you sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. A lot of the information I'm talking about is there, and a lot of examples are in there. And I, I actually put some examples in there of runs that I've done personally and processed. And as you say, I mean, it's really interesting and actually could be helpful to all of our municipalities. Yeah, that's yeah, what I was thinking. Exactly. Piggyback those resources, right? Yeah. Need to. yeah. One, of the, one of the big challenges here, uh, before we get rolling, though, is making sure we have all the right procedures. And, uh, um, um, the Air, Air Transport Canada um, you, has a lot of uh, Procedures and regulations that you're expected. Oh, to really? Do. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So that's, all, that's all part of the licensing. So, you know, we, we yeah. need to come up with standard operating procedures and, and proper logs and all this. Yeah. So, this is a lot of the front work we got to do, uh, as well as get the insurance and things like that. And then, then we'll be able to start, start working on it. And some, some of the guys will be updating their licenses as well. The people that are involved right now have a basic license. And I think I'll probably be working towards an advanced license similar mm -hmm. to what I have. Great. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Jerry. To the chair. So is this something that as it progresses could actually be marketable? Like you you as an organization could actually help other CAs and maybe recoup some expense or even local municipalities recoup some expense by expanding that. It could be, but I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Is there something we can do? I don't know. Yeah, it's part of our innovation. There's a lot of opportunity and growth horizontally and vertically with something like this. Like Warren said, I think a lot of the works this year and just starting off with one project in mind. And once we kind of have that base work, we can, there's other CAs that are interested. Um, there's some that are doing it, some that aren't. Um, just having the right expertise in it, but having that in house would be definitely a value. Yeah. How would this work with GIS? Would it? When those maps could be used in GIS, they could be. Yeah, because they're they're three three dimensional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when you render the maps, it is in a format, a very similar format that we do. Uh, uh, God, that, that that would speed up a lot of processes. Yeah. 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 Um, we'd have to be. Cognizant of the data it takes up. Obviously, like one uh, one centimeter or one uh, inch data is going to take up a lot more space yeah. than our current like one meter data and things like that. But those are all challenges that we mm. can and that's why we, we would do that more in a focused area than than try to cover yeah. everything. Yeah, you know, well, <laughs> because the, the data is so high in yeah. resolution. Right? Right. Well, thank but, you. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, through you, Madam Chair. Now, what sort of um, hardware do you need to do this? Like, can you do this with DJI? DJI yeah, in fact, we have to level up. Yeah, um, you, you need maps that are, uh, or you need drones that, that have uh, basically a, a mechanical shutter. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of drones have rolling shutters. 
Um, and the problem is when you're moving quickly and taking photos, the rolling shutters can distort the image, right? Uh, so we have we have two drones. Uh, we have um, uh, Mini 3 Pro. Okay. And that one's is just for taking basic photography and stuff like that. You wouldn't use that for mapping. That has a rolling shutter and everything. Okay. We also have a Mavic 3 Enterprise. And that Enterprise one does have a proper shutter for, for doing mapping. Personally, I have a Phantom 4 Pro, which also has a mechanical shutter. And it does. it's one of the most common drone, drones out there used. So yeah, DJI drones do, but you have to make sure you get the right model with the uh, mechanical shutter. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because and and they even have their own mapping software and and auto, uh, automatic uh, operation software as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's also third party solutions for that. And some of them have different focuses in that. Like, um, I'm just trying to think. Propeller, for example, that software will work with that drone, and it's geared more towards construction, which could be a use that we could use it for as well. Mm -hmm truck construction kind of doing things right and uh yeah and then there's other software that's more geared towards environmental stuff uh, like drone deploy is more more about mapping that we would use for environmental reasons so yeah yeah i was um i was looking at them myself and uh my first um, requirement I thought what I wanted them for was crop scouting and I, I did look at the phantom because it had the uh the ability to have an infrared sensor on it too, and you could scout for crop diseases at the same time hmm. through infrared sensing. So, yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate that they stopped making that Phantom too, because yeah. the Phantom was the one drone that was kind of universal. I have one, and, it, and it's great for video, it's great for mapping, it's, it's a great all around one. But, but DJI has actually split off a lot of their drones that make it make them more specialized. I guess they're trying to sell more drones or something, but but uh, just for example, a, a Mavic 3 Pro is not good for mapping. It's great for videography. And then Mavic 3 Enterprise is made for mapping. So they're specializing a lot of their drones. Mm -hmm. But uh, so you have to make sure you get the right one for the for the job now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. Thank, Thank you. you. That was yeah. really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Can I get a motion to receive Warren's presentation? Carol, mm -hmm. Tracy, all in favor? Carrie, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 6.2 Durham Watershed Planning. Brett Traguno, aquatic biologist. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Brett Trigano. I'm happy to present to you today on Durham Watershed Planning. So we're down in the southwest corner of our jurisdiction. Um, aquatic biologist, just fancy title for somebody who likes water, loves playing in water. <laughs> Hopefully dro our drones don't take my job away. <laughs> so, right, Warren? Yeah. You'll see. <laughs> They're taking everybody's jobs away. But anyways, um, yeah, nice to be here and talk about this project. Um, and so Durham region, you know, in our jurisdiction, it's about 20, 20% of our jurisdiction and about 20% of Durham region's jurisdiction because they're both around 2,500 square kilometers. So it's about one fifth of each jurisdiction. So quite a sizable chunk and just, um, a beautiful, beautiful place to work. I love, I love down there. I love the lake, um, the Ellsler Marsh, the Oak Ridge Marine, the different eskers and landforms and creeks. Just a yeah, beautiful place. So really, uh, really happy that uh, I'm able to work down there. Um, and so just a little bit of background about this project. It's a, it's a category two, so it's a special capital project for Durham region. It was initiated, initiated a few years ago. Um, and since there's kind of been three project phases, um, but the primary objective of the project is to, to keep our planners, um, both our staff planners and our municipal planners, up to date um, with their mapping of these provincially regulated features. Um, so we use mapping as kind of a key tool, um, a key approximation of our regulated features, uh, you know, where they are on the landscape, things like water courses and wetlands and hazard areas and that type of thing. And so we wanna make sure this mapping is, is pretty up to snuff. Um, and so, you know, planners use this information to increase the effectiveness of development application uh, like the, the whole process and the, and the development 
approval process. Um, so what we're trying to achieve with this is really better client service. You know, you can, um, there's been many times where, you know, someone's come in, say a farmer's come in and looked at our mapping and said, I've been farming there for years. There's no blue line there, right? <laughs> so why am I here for a permit? Um, and so we're trying to proactively kind of get out there, look at that in more detail and be like, no, there's no creek there, right? Or maybe there is a creek there and it wasn't mapped. And so um, client service is a big thing. And then also to save money, right? When that, um, you know, you can picture that farmer, whoever that, that's come in, that takes their time. Um, and in many cases too, if, if the information is out of date, planners will flag that and require, for example, a consultant to come in and kind of fill those gaps, right? Um, and so we can, we can kind of get, in there before where possible to save you know time and money and so that, that's that's the primary objective of this and so there's um there's a lot of guiding provincial policy out there that planners use um for provincial policy statement is kind of lays the foundation uh there's the green belt plan Oak Ridge's moraine conservation plan growth plan these are all kind of overarching provincial pieces of um policy under the planning act um, that really specify, you know, where are these features on the landscape and which policies apply. So certain policies are more restrictive around development, for example, you know, uh, larger buffer zones or setbacks or requirements for studies um, than other areas. And of course, we have our plan review and regulations policies. And so it helps with, um, with our regulations as well. So phase one was around 2019. This was a two-year capital project. And this coincided with the Envision Durham um, project uh, down at the region. We're working with Amanda Bath and the planner, lead planner down there and Lino Trombino. And just to basically say, okay, where are we? Let's, let's map these things. And so the two key um, things we like, we'd like to map, which I'll go over in a sec, are key hydrological features and areas and key natural heritage features. So these are kind of buzzwords in the provincial policy that have meaning in the provincial context and have certain policies uh, that apply. We also, um, uh, about 10 or more years ago, we did some watershed plans um, as part of the Oak Ridge's Marine Conservation Plan as a requirement. And so we wanted to take a look at those and say, hey, do they still conform to um, provincial policy requirements when they, when they uh, produced the growth plan and updated the Greenbelt Plan back a few years ago? So here's a list of kind of, um, we call you know the arteries basically of our landscape. So this is all the significant water um, resources in that that we that we take a look at. So permanent intermittent streams, uh, lakes and their littoral areas. So Lake Scugog and the shoreline around Lake Scugog, seepage areas and springs. So the kind of groundwater upwelling areas, wetlands, significant groundwater recharge areas. Um, so these are, are the kind of these porous sands and gravels that would recharge our, our wetlands and, and creeks and that type of thing, our aquifers. Highly vulnerable aquifers, you might have heard of that through source water protection. So this is where we get our, um, a lot of our private drinking water from, sometimes municipal as well. Actually, in Port Perry, it is, it is groundwater. Um, and significant surface water contribution areas. So I'm going to give some examples of some of those in a minute. Um, Here's an example of some of our key findings with significant surface water contribution areas. So we wanted to know, you know, where do our creeks get their water from? Not all catchments are created equal. And so you can see here, we've, we've done flow monitoring on all these catchments um, and uh, the darker color red produce more water per unit of area than the light ones. So Sorry, for, is, it, is that map all of Durham region? Is that this is Durham region within our jurisdiction. So just the southwest corner. Okay. Yeah, so here's the Oak Ridge's Moraine here. Port Perry is right about here. There's Lake Scugog. Yeah. And so up here would be Brock Township, uh, Scugog Township, and, and a little bit of Clarington down there. Right in the southwest of our jurisdiction. Oh, I see. The southwest of your jurisdiction, jurisdiction which is the north part of Durham region. And, That's correct. And... What else? The north part of Durham region and yeah, that's all. That's it. Okay, it's all Durham. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Right at the boundary. So here's City Cortha Lakes here. This boundary. 
Right oh, I recognize Brock Townsend up at, up at the top. Yep. We have our yeah. big uh, pop up behind yes. us, so you can kind right. of get an airplane of the uh, municipal boundaries. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> and so this is a really cool way now where planners can can understand which watersheds are important contributors of of our surface waters. You know where the where the where the waters in the creeks come from. We also looked at key natural heritage features. So a lot of these are um, under the district jurisdiction of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So a little less related to our kind of core regulations and that type of thing. Um, but we can still help planners out. A lot of cases. Um, so you can see there all the list of key natural heritage features. Um, I won't go through them all there, but again, these are kind of more on the wildlife side of things, where the other ones were more on the water, um, but there's still linkages um, between the two as well. An example of some of the key findings that we did for this, this is fish habitat. Um, so here's all the, all the creeks, um, rivers that flow in the area and there's about 700 kilometers uh, linear kilometers if you were to add up all those sections and um, so they're all potentially fish habitat but those darker blue ones these are the ones that the province uh, mostly cares about in the federal government for sure is canada these are cold water um, sensitive fish habitats so these are trout streams and they're uh, it's about 30 35 percent of this area about a third or so are these sensitive streams. So we're able to now help the province um, and the region kind of map these so they can flag them in their, in their development applications. Sorry for the small text, but this is related to our watershed plan conformity exercise. And so we just, uh, what we did was we looked at, um, for example, in the Greenbelt plan, they have what a watershed plan, plan shall contain. So there's a whole listing here, nutrient loading assessments, water budgets, environmental monitoring plan, that type of thing. And then we basically ran through our Lake Skewer environmental management plan, our Oak Ridge Marine watershed plans, uh, then our fisheries plan that we helped it with the province. And we said, where are, we, where are there gaps? Where do we need to do more work? And one of the biggest ones that's kind of relevant to us um, is, is this scenario modeling for the impacts of forecasted growth. Um, so, for example, um, looking into the future, all that growth, how is that going to impact, you know, our watershed resources, for example, and then also the consideration of climate change. So this one here, even though it's yellow, it says limited in scope. At the time when we did these plans, yeah, climate change was a thing, but it's, it, it's not as um, high priority as it is now. And it wasn't kind of enshrined in, in kind of legislation, provincial policy back then, like it is now. And so we... Uh, we took a closer look at those things as well through this project. Phase two was 2021 and 22. Um, we focused on four things. One, we wanted to map all these permanent intermittent streams. So we did a, a desktop exercise to actually verify the location using most up-to-date mapping. Um, on the wetlands, which I'll talk about, I'll give an example in a sec, we wanted to confirm these unevaluated wetlands, which we weren't sure of. I mentioned the climate change. So we updated our water quantity and water quality assessments for Lake Scugog. And for example, you know, we, um, we conclude that there'll be about a 20 to 40% nutrient loading increase um, under climate change scenarios into the lake and about a loss of about 10% of those cold water streams that, that we mapped um, just because of, of climate change. And we also worked with, um, with the region to identify these significant groundwater recharge areas and map them a little bit better. So I just wanted to focus on wetlands because this is a, uh, you know, a key regulated feature for us. And this map shows all the wetlands um, confirmed or otherwise within this area. And the green and the blue, these are um, field verified wetlands. So provincial staff, in many cases us, you know, a few decades ago, we would actually go out there and um, walk around on the private property and confirm that this in fact is a wetland and meets the criteria and map it. And of course the mapping boundaries change, um, you know, from time to time, but generally those blobs are, are there. They are where they say they are. The ones that we're kind of concerned about are these red ones. 
So all of these red ones here, which is almost half of them, um, they have not been ground truthed. So these have been either flagged through satellite imagery or kind of our look at aerial imagery in, and we think it's a wetland, not 100% sure. And um, so these are the ones we really see as like an area of actually uh, even more work in the, in the future, um, because like I said before, it could have such an impact on the average person, um, time and money that we really need to get a handle on these. So we're just gonna just focus in on two areas and I'll show you what I mean. Um, so down in the Manchester area in the Southwest there and then on Scugog Island. So here's one kind of near Manchester, uh, I think it's Scugog Fourth Line Road. And um, we've got a lot of blobs of red. Right, so they, hasn't, they haven't been ground truthed. Now these right now are on our wetlands regulations mapping. So if somebody, or they were, if somebody were to go to our map, they want to do something, they would see this. Oh, we need a permit from Corps of Conservation and it triggers up a process. So, but when we take a closer look, so we actually drove around where we could and tried to feel, field verify uh, where we could see them. And that's just a soybean field. <laughs> at least it was at that time, a couple years ago. So. Um, so we would remove that from our mapping and everybody was happy. We're happy because it's, you know, not a wetland. We didn't lose a wetland. Now there could have been a time of course, where that was converted. Um, you know, the farmer, for example, might have, and you know, if, if, if it did meet actually our definition of a wetland and it's outside of that two year kind of window, then you know, there's nothing we can do about it. It is what it is. But um, you know, our assessment is it's no longer there, therefore it's not on our, you know, it needs to be removed from our mapping. Not regulated. Here's a other case on Scugog Island. <clears throat> so um, again, these are all uh, unverified wetlands. This is a quite a large chunk, the largest chunk of unverified wetland. Um, but we, when we actually look at it more closely, it is a wetland. Um, you can see all these kind of you know, vegetation areas there, it's low lying, it does meet our definition. Um, now, so it is a regulated kind of feature within our regulated context. Um, but there's also the case, we also kind of flagged it through whether or not it would be provincially significant. So this has um, implications from a planning context. And um, under the old rules, so prior to January 1st, 2023, this would have been provincially significant. Um, under the new rules, since then, it's not provincially significant. And that's because um, issues with complexing. So for example, the new rules, you would evaluate this blob on its own, this blob on its own, these blobs on their own. And so it's, um, yeah. So long story short, there's a lot of wetland mapping that we can really improve upon. Um, to kind of field verify these sites, evaluations, and that type of thing. So we see that's a really opportunity for us in the future. And just lastly, so um, phase three, uh, we, we wanted to take a closer look at Port Perry uh, with these permanent intermittent streams, um, fish habitat, information on Scugog Island was really lacking, and um, these sand barrens, savannas, and tall grass prairies, so our, our natural meadows information was lacking as well. And so, um, Here's just an, an example of how we evaluate whether a, a, a blue line on a map is is uh, is regulated feature. So often we can categorize it into ephemeral streams, intermittent or perennial. So um, ephemeral just kind of means after a snow melt, it might flow, but it generally it dries up most of the year. There's really no defined better banks. There's no transition between a kind of a terrestrial and an aquatic zone. Um, it's just kind of a flow path for, for drainage. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's perennial creeks. These creeks tend to flow all year and they have well-defined bed and banks. Um, they have sorted material, sands and gravels, for example, or aquatic plants, um, kind of like clear defined channel. And so those ones are regulated. They meet our definition of a water course. Uh, whereas the ephemeral ones, typically they're not regulated. These ones in between, these intermittent ones, um, where we get out there and they're often dry, um, they're more challenging for us. And so it depends, these ones. 
Uh, if it has, with, with actually there's just new rules that just came out recently and will be enforced in, uh, in April of this year, um, it would be a regulated feature if it has kind of continuous well-defined banks. And here's just an example of a product in Port Perry. So uh, this is the urban area, the urban boundaries of Port Perry. And we walked all of these streams and actually put it through that, that filter of ephemeral, perennial, intermittent to see which ones are regulated or not. Um, and about 10% or so, so these gray, these gray ones here, uh, up there and up there, they were um, taken off our mapping. So these ones are ephemeral. There's a lot that were buried as well, kind of in through town by the, uh, by the fire station on Williams Creek. Um, they're technically not regulated either. Uh, although they do flow underground in a, in a pipe. Oh, sorry. And last slide, I believe. So our work plan for this year, we want to, we really saw some discrepancies in some fish habitat mapping. So you can see here the, the, the red line, that's supposed to be not cold water fish habitat. But when we went out there and did some water temperature assessments, we got dark, like low temperatures. So we think that actually there could be sensitive fish there and vice versa. There's a lot of mapping that says it's cold water, but our temperature studies indicate, no, it's probably warm. And so there's some discrepancy there. We wanna make sure we get that right. So there's no kind of debates and you know, during the file review process. And Blackstock streams and wetlands, there's a lot of funky stuff going on in Blackstock, a lot of different drainage um, by the fairgrounds, for example. And so we want to, do similar mapping like we did in Port Perry, just get it all straight for, for Blackstock. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and then Lake Scugog shoreline as well. A lot of features haven't been mapped along the lake, along the shoreline. Um, so we want to look at uh, basically high risk development, you know, areas like um, steep slopes, uh, fish habitat, water courses, wetlands, and that type of thing. And yes, yeah, thank you for your attention. So we've got all of these um, products. There's, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot more in these in our technical reports. They're available on our website. And of course, we have our mapping tool um, down in the bottom right there as kind of the, the first first stop shop for the average landowner or developer to see if their if their area is regulated. So most of this information has been updated into that mapping or is is ongoing right now. Stop there. Yeah, thanks. thanks Brett. For Are there any questions of Brett? Yeah, Peter. With care, uh, what's the temperature range on the cold water streams? Thanks to you, uh, Madam Chair. So <clears throat> typically it's 17 degrees Celsius, it's kind of the cutoff. Um, under 20 is still potential. Okay. And anything over 25 is, is basically lethal. Okay. What time of year? So that would be the summer. Because, of course, right now, yeah, everything's that, cold. That's what I'm asking. Yep, so that would be mostly in the summer, um, kind of the June, July, August, halfway through September window. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is it sure? I'm wondering over the last 20 years or so, and then moving forward from now, when any development or any severance or anything that happened municipally and news got involved, would that information that was dealt with at that moment in time ever get reflected back, back on the mapping when they'd actually go and do a review or an assessment or whatever you want to call it? If the mapping was at a date, would that have been caught up or is that the plan moving forward that it would be? One would tie into the other. Yeah, through you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, great question. Usually, so um, the province, so Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, they're usually the ones, for example, for um, the water courses. They have a, a layer, um, and they're the ones responsible across the province for updates. So we send our updates whenever we go through the process. We have a, an internal procedure here where we would um, flag it through our mapping department, have a rationale on record as to why, you know, when the site visit was, what's the rationale for either taking it off or mapping or putting it on. And so we, we, all, we have that logged here. And it's so- not necessarily get done at the provincial level. 
Uh, well, potentially. I mean, we would we would submit it to the province, yes. okay. and um, usually they're pretty good at including those changes. And through you, Madam Chair, there is a there has been a bit of a switch that we've noticed since the wetland uh, evaluation was updated, hmm. in that they are looking for the entire wetland to be uh, evaluated before they make any changes. Hmm. So what we are doing uh, as a result is uh, so with development applications. Uh, what we're doing is we're refining our wetland boundary uh, on the regulation side um, and keeping track of that. So now there's uh, two wetland layers that are being created, one with our modifications based on site visits uh, that maybe eventually get to uh, to the MNR, um, but otherwise it's the provincial layer is the one that they're starting to so there's a more wholesome uh, update for the entire wetland. Yeah, Brett, um, so... You, you showed us an area that was possibly a wetland that was filled in, possibly. Um, do we have any data like from years ago that, yes, that was a, a wetland, but it is no longer a wetland? Is there some sort of data? Yeah, yes. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, we, do, we do have that. So through our watershed report card process, um, we do look at aerial imagery about every five years or so. Well, it depends on how often we get it. Um, and in Durham region, it's pretty good. Actually, we get it even more often than the five years. Uh, and so, yes, we do have the ability to, um, the, the protocol we use is called ecological land classification. Just a, a way of looking at the mapping and classifying, you know, the polygons, right, the blobs. And so, yes, we do have that. And we do have the, the uh, possibility of going back in time um, zooming in on certain areas and or kind of lumping them all together and looking at, you know, have we increased or decreased? Well, yes, thank you to you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, and further to that point and to another map you had up there, Brett, on, on Stugog Island, um, in that um, wetland on the island, I was just wondering how, what the regs pertain to there. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, with this area right in here. Um, you say that most of these regs pertain to development. How do they pertain to agriculture? Like it could go back to this point where you, there was a wetland there, but if somebody ran a tile through it, you know, all of a sudden it's arable land now. That could change very quickly. So in this area there, if that is a wetland now, that has to be permitted to be drained, or can it be drained with permits? Or what are can it what be protected? <laughs> well, <laughs> or, or both. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. what's it better being? If it's if it's better to be protected, then it should be protected. But I'm going to argue in some cases it might be better being farmland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great question to you, Madam Chair. Um, so the provincial policy is pretty good around farming. Okay. Right. A lot of it says like no provincial policy is intended to restrict farming where it actively occurs. Okay. And so if there's, um, for example, the scenario we get a lot is pasture land in a what we, we would be meet our definition of a wetland, right? Uh, you know, it's got the hydric soils, water loving soils, and high water table. It's got the plants, right, and everything connected to surface water. So, um, in those cases. Um, generally, agriculture, it's, it's fine. But what farmers want to do is totally permissible, and we always have to um, come up with a solution that works for everybody. If um, now there's been some cases, which is a little bit more tricky, mm -hmm. when you look back in time and say, well, my grandpa used to farm it, right? And I've let it go, but now I'm, I'm coming back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the ones that are a little bit more tricky. Okay. Um, we go back, that's why our ortho imagery is so important, our aerial imagery is so important, so that we can see, um, you know, was it truly farmed in the past, or was that just, you know, I thought it was when I was a kid, I was playing around there, and, um, and so those ones can be a little bit more interesting, yeah. but if, if there's no farming activity at all, and it's currently regulated as a wetland, then that's usually now it's starting to favor on our side a little bit more, yeah. you know, not favor, but uh, protect more restrictive policies around wetland protection. Yeah. I ask this because I have uh, I have 50 acres of conservation land that abuts the Oster Marsh right at the bottom of that <laughs> lake, and it fits quite nicely into that what you just spoke of. 
that it was farmed and it is, is now conservation land and that's so it's uh it's right on the edge there so and you know if you get a really wet year sometimes it's flooded too but so that would come back and interesting no thank you very much and for you, Madam Chair, just further to your point, um, there is a clause in the Conservation Authorities Act. So the Planning Act deals with advanced uh, kind of uh, planning uh, for development. Our regulation deals with activity, which is uh, which usually comes after planning or it doesn't hit the planning process. Uh, so that's the distinction between uh, sort of the planning process and PBS and all that sort of stuff with uh, with regulations themselves. Um, and so what, uh, what we have is in our conservation authorities regulation is, is a clause specifically uh, related to agriculture uh, that says uh, in the wetland component that uh, uh, it's not a regulated feature if, uh, if the area exhibits, uh, no longer exhibits a wetland characteristic. Uh, based on farming activity, essentially. Uh, so there is that caveat. It's a little tricky because it's not really well defined, um, but but there is a caveat in there for, for agriculture, and that's where uh, you know, Matt and his team and uh, Brett and uh, uh, some other folks from uh, from Nancy's team get involved in order to assess that and figure out whether or not there's a, uh, there has been a sort of farming activity. Okay. 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 Tracy, question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's where I was going to go, and I was going to wonder if I can send you a, an email myself, just with some questions, because down in my neck of the woods, there's a ton of tile drain going on, and we're, you know, we're looking at those changing stream flows and the effect of erosion in these areas, right, which are impacting our wetlands. And I just, I need to understand it better because it's happening constantly, and I have. Um, people reaching out to me, residents, you know, concerned. I just need to have some background. So if you don't mind, I'll just send you a few email questions. Absolutely, I'm happy to help. Thanks. Korea? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I think at the beginning of your presentation, you said you are working with um, sort of local municipality um, planners. So can I just inquire, have you been working with the planners at the So mostly, through you, Madam Chair, mostly it's been at the region. So uh, me personally, I haven't. I'm sure our staff have. Um, Harmon Preet, uh, and perhaps Matt, you could probably comment on that better than I. But um, my work through this has generally been with the region. Okay. Okay. So I'd have to just follow that up and, and find out. And do you have any comments on the Leighton River at all? Have you been around it? That's that's in, that's the the part of Brock Township that's towards the lakes conservation. So yeah, through you, Madam Chair, um, beautiful river. Yeah, really lucky to be to be near there. It definitely has some challenges. Yeah. Uh, actually, some of our staff, ten or water quality specialists, just led a um, a report on the water quality of Leighton River, and I believe it's just going through internal review now. If it's not recently published, mm -hmm. but uh, I can send that. To, we can send that to you. Right. I guess that will follow up. Come to us as a board. Uh, any I would love to have come it. to the board for sure. Uh, we don't want to inundate you with all the reports that uh, that we have. Uh, it is just send it to Korea. But certainly anything that you're interested in, we make it available uh, on our website as well. Um, and if you want to highlight that, uh, yeah, that's exactly. But what I would be especially here. interested in that one. Yeah, yeah great. Living right beside, I think, and Matt, also having constituents. Matt, do you have some comments? That you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I did. I, I was going to say uh, for uh, Director Richardson, Tracy's fine. That if you'd like to see me as well, I'll yes. provide some input on, on this as well. Actually, I'm very interested in that in the whole tile drainage yeah. issue. As it, uh, so, please include me on that one too. And, and I know I that was Mark one. Yeah, that, had, that's an issue. We had a big yeah. conversation on um, yeah. sort of the and, long term and, effects yeah. of tile change. Exactly. We've got to talk about it. And Cortha Lakes has a long history of issues with tile drains. So, and yes, I mean, I my area is really heavily impacted with industrial farming and tile draining. So, mm -hmm. I need to understand it better. Yeah, I'd like to too. Great, super. Well, thanks a lot, Brett. Thank you. Yeah, can we have a motion to receive Brett's uh, presentation? Jerry, Korea, all in favor? Jerry, thank you. And we're on to seven point one permits issued by designated staff for January.
And Matt Mantle, Director of Planning and Development. You're on, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and through you, um, as found on page 14 of the agenda, the total number of permits issued by designated staff over 23 permits during January. Uh, for the reporting period, we received uh, reviewed about 78% of the permits within CALP timelines, and 83% of the permits were issued within Conservation Ontario CALP timelines. Um, this uh, slight drop in percentage was due to uh, staff time being allocated to year end reporting. Um, we are seeking resolution that Section 28 permits issued by staff um, has been received. Thank you. Great. Okay. Are there any questions for Matt? Korea? No? No. Okay. Can I have a motion to receive uh, the um, planning and development uh, 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 permit? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Jerry, seconder. Yeah, okay. Harold? Sure. All in favor? Carry. Great. Okay, 7.2 annual permitting report. You're back on, Matt. Again, and through you also. Um, page 19 through to page 25 of the agenda. Uh, 2023 was a busy year regarding permitting. Uh, we issued 478 permits. Wow. Well, which was uh, um, above the observed, uh, about 10% increase from the previous year in 2022, where we only, where we issued 427 permits. Uh -huh. um, when comparing how we met the provincial standards, we issued approximately 83% of permits within the timelines. Um, and, uh, and then with the Conservation Ontario guidelines, we met about 65% of the issued um, permits within that timeline. Um, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, through Jer the chair. Yeah, Jerry? I just want to or would associate the uptick with like what kind of permitting was generating the most new volume? Um, that's a fair question. Uh, I think it was a spread, but I'd have to look into it a little oh, bit. I just, I just wonder something that you caught right off the top that you saw an uptick in. No big deal. Any other questions? Okay, I need a motion to uh, uh, accept the permitting performance report, please. Okay, Jerry, Kriya, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Okay, and 7.2, um, the annual permitting report. Thank you, for you, Madam Chair. As found on page 26 of the agenda, we seek resolution of the uh, permit application submission pursuant to Ontario Regulation 182-06 for uh, 102 Sugarbush Trail within the township of Feather Falls be approved and permitted uh, to demolish and construct the proposed in water boathouse with attached uh, storage structure. Um, for background, the property is located along the eastern shoreline of, of uh, Cameron Lake, and which is uh, northwest of Feather Falls. Uh, as mentioned previously, the application is pro applicant is proposing the demolition of an existing boathouse and replacing it with a two-story boathouse, including attached storage structure with a total approximate area of 211 meters squared. The proposed work can meet the majority of forest conservation policies with, with exception to the construction of a two-story boathouse and having a maximum of uh, being greater than the maximum size of 80 meters squared within the footprint. Um, the attached storage structure proposed is above the uh, Canadian, both above the Canadian, uh, Cameron Lake 100 year regulated flood elevation of 255.7 meters above sea level and the free board elevation of 256 uh, meters above sea level, which meets the dry flood proofing guidelines. Um, uh, the, regarding the second story, um, it is proposed to be have an open floor from the top section of the second story through to the bottom floor, um, which uh, proposes no have no uh, uh, floor space within that second story. Um, it contains a wet slip within the bottom uh, along the ground floor of it, and uh, li limited opportunity to convert that space into habitable space, from my opinion. Um, staff are of the opinion the proposed modifications and subsequent construction will not increase the flood risk to public safety, uh, property damage, or property damage from a natural hazard perspective. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, Jerry? Through the chair. I was trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. We're going to build a house out in the water. Yeah. Why are we worried about the 100 year flood level? Like it's going to be temporary. We're already building it out in the water. It didn't seem relevant to me that the water might come high for a week or a day. There's a couple of uh, hazards that are associated with that to be about the chair site. Um, uh, one is uh, the structure could potentially during a flood event have uh, flows that are uh, coming perpendicular to it and will lift the structure and pull it along. So we were checking to make sure that they're anchoring it and uh, constructing appropriately with, uh, in some cases, we asked for openings on either side of the walls so that the water could actually flow through the structure in that event. Um, there's also uh, uh, electrical or other features that could be potentially installed within the flood and not be waterproofed, which could cause another hazard to the middle of the system. Fair enough. The erosion could also be an issue as well, um, along with the structure itself for after accessing the building. Tracy, thank you. Through you. In the report, you talked about a two story, right? Yeah. But the recommendation is to be limited to a single story? Um, through Madam Chair, um, the we have not a written response, but a verbal response saying that the the reason why it's open <coughs> for second story is story is to allow access to their boat once lifted inside the structure. So it's not posing any. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, the boats here, and then they I, yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah, good catch. Yeah. <laughs> I wondered why there you go yeah okay any other questions okay can i have a motion to uh uh receive the report please tracy peter all in favor carried great and Madam Chair, just for, for clarity also approved the uh the permit uh yeah. in yes suit. yes yeah. along with that yep. do you need a separate uh, no, it doesn't say that. Uh, yeah, just they are thinking count is maybe I missed that. because it's beyond. Oh, that one there. Okay, yeah. okay, sure. So I, I guess I separately um, resolve that the permit application submitted pursuant to Ontario Regulation One Eighty Two Zero Six Regulation of Development <coughs> Interference and in Wetlands and Alteration to Shorelines and Water Courses to allow the demolition and reconstruction of an in-water boathouse at 102 Sugarbush Trail, City of Kortha Lakes, be approved and permitted. Okay, Jerry and uh, Tracy, all in favor? Carried, great, thank you. Okay, so we're on to 7.4, watershed-based resource management strategy. Nancy. Hello, um, so I'm here today just to provide introduction to the development of the watershed-based resource management strategy. Um, the province recently introduced Ontario Regulation 686.21, which is regarding inquiry programs and services. As part of that regulation, it requires all conservation authorities to prepare this strategy, and it has to be made available to the public by the end of this year. Um, the purpose of the strategy is to assist our conservation authorities with evolving and enhancing the delivery of our core programs. Um, and to improve efficiencies and the effectiveness of our core programs. Part of this strategy um, will include following components such as guiding principles and objectives, um, a summary of existing technical studies, monitoring and information of our natural resources. Um, it will also include the review of the authority's program and services provided for the purposes of determining if our program and services um, comply with the regulation, also identify and analyze issues of risk that limit the effectiveness, and the delivery of these programs and identifying actions to address the issues and mitigations and risks identified by the review. We also, as part of the strategy, have to outline a process for the periodic review. Um, part of this regulation sets out focus on just provincially mandated programs and services. However, it does allow flexibility for us to, to look at our category twos and category threes, which we have chosen to do. Um, our approach and timeline. So we started this strategy um, in January. Um, so now um, we're develop we're going to use the framework that was provided through Conservation Ontario. So basically the framework outlines a set of um, steps that we can follow through. And as we work through these key components of the frameworks, we'll be seeking consultation through from staff, municipal partners, First Nations communities, academia, and the public. 
Um, so in that board report, um, you can see our anticipated timeline. So throughout 2024, we will be reporting back on key milestones that we have um, done throughout the year with hopefully having um, board approval on our draft strategy in September and then the ultimate approval in November. Um, so the next steps over the next few months, as we navigate through the first few tiers of the framework, we are establishing a strategic guidance group, similar to the one we did with the environmental monitoring strategy, which will include municipal partners, academia, and staff. It will help review materials and provide feedback on our key milestones. Um, we will be coming back to you in May um, with a project update that will include the results from a, a public engagement survey that we intend to do over the next couple of months. Great, thank you, Nancy. Are there any uh, questions of Nancy Esmond? Okay, can I have a motion to receive Nancy's uh, presentation? Okay, Peter, Kriya, all in favor? Carried, great. Okay, thank you. So we're on to uh, 7.5, Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, Annual Statistical Report, and Mark. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this uh, this report is actually a new report that uh, we have never done in our history uh, before. So, uh, but I uh, thought it would be important to share with you the um, the annual report that we are uh, obligated to uh, to issue under legislation uh, to uh, to respond to any municipal uh, freedom of information act uh, requests. Uh, and uh, so it's here for uh, for receipt of information. Um, there there is a requirement as a public body to uh, to respond to requests for information. And uh, we did have a couple of requests uh, throughout the year. Uh, they do take a bit of time to, uh, to work out. Um, there are some fees at uh, times that, uh, that are required as well, uh, just to actually file the uh, request and then uh, a set of kind of rules established to, um, to establish the costs for, for doing that. They really don't cover your costs, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but there is a general requirement to make sure that, uh, that we're able to provide that. Uh, information that people ask for, and also protect people's privacy at the same time. Uh, so, so under the uh, MFEPA, um, there is a, a head that is identified. Uh, so the board has delegated that to to me in order to carry out the MFEPA so it's done on a on a timely basis. So, uh, so based on that, I just wanted to make sure that we reported back uh, uh, to you on that front. Uh, so the report is attached. Uh, April 1st is when it's due. Um, and uh, so we've uh, finalized the, the report and uh, we did forward it on uh, before the timeline, which is great. Uh, the, uh, the guidelines that they provide are really just very general. It's like, how many times is it hit? X, Y, Z process uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, uh, processing of the information. So we had two uh, formal requests for records. Uh, we had one that carried over from, from last year. We only report in the calendar year. So uh, for the two that we received last year, one is actually carried forward to this year. Uh, so that is not uh, part of the reporting on this, but the one that we had uh, carried over from the previous year uh, went to all the way to, uh, to an adjudicated uh, decision from, uh, from an adjudicator. So, uh, so that was uh, unique. Uh, also the first time in our history that uh, that occurred. Uh, and, uh, and so as it runs through, it identifies a number of, uh, uh, number of those pieces. We did uh, a lot of information that we have, uh, if it's related to uh, uh, planning and permits, for instance, uh, and it have uh, third party information in it. So there's another process that, uh, that, we, that we have to follow in order to make sure there's appropriate notice and that uh, there's some comfortability. It's still in the end, our decision to release or not. Um, and uh, there's an appeal process to do that as well. So uh, like I say, it is quite involved uh, and this report just highlights all of that uh, information. Um, we did have one instance where personal information was disclosed. Uh, the, the impact was small um, and uh, only involved uh, really two individuals. Uh, so, so that uh, was something that we were able to handle uh, and went through a procedure in order to ensure that, uh, uh, that the disclosure was assessed in terms of uh, policies, procedures that we have in place, uh, you know, how to happen, but also deletion of material from, from the person that received that uh, as well. So, uh, so we had followed the full uh, kind of uh, process to make sure that that risk and liability was, uh, was minimized. And, uh, and both parties were, were cooperative in that, in that process. So, uh, so that is really the report. Uh, happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Jerry? Through the chair, please. I'm trying to wrap my head because I know nothing about this FOI thing. Yeah. I mean, 
Um, I'm scared when I see stuff at the federal level where it takes a long time to get it out and it's pages of blacked out ink. What at our level is so sensitive and what kind of requests would the average uh, Freedom of Information Act require? I, I, I saw the bit about the little confrontation with something personal. I, I just can't wrap my head around what information that might involve or how the whole process works. Yeah, so um, so there, as a public body, there's any information can be requested, right? A single as a municipality uh, would, uh, would have uh, freedom of information requests uh, performed on it. Uh, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, you know, any of the provincial or federal ministries, uh, they operate under two different acts in that case. But uh, for us, it's the Municipal Freedom of Information Act. Um, what we traditionally see uh, over time is uh, related to our permits. Uh, so, so there's uh, uh, sometimes a neighbor is interested in what another neighbor is, is doing, and uh, and then use the FIPA process to to get that information. That's typically what we see here. Mm. Um, and so, in having that, what we have to do is make sure that uh, their information uh, is protected. So, as you can imagine, we're collecting all sorts of records. There's an obligation to disclose records um, as well, but uh, but there are exemptions to the act in order to protect their their information and their their privacy. Uh, an example is uh, address, telephone number, uh, and name. Uh, so address is fine. That's why uh, all of our agendas go through an MFIP review before we send it out, uh, as does your, your councils as well. Uh, so any information yeah. that, uh, that is personal, we, we remove it from, from, uh, from public record. Uh, and, uh, and that's so that people don't phone up, you know, uh, so, and so there's not an immediate identification of a name and a property and, uh, and therefore being able to use it for, for any information. That's actually written into the legislation. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is protected, and uh, and then third-party information uh, is uh, there's an element around confidentiality um, and uh, uh, sort of patents and a whole bunch of different criteria that things could be exempt for, and and so that's why we go to third-party review to make sure that uh, those people uh, who have been engaged in services for. Uh, building a boathouse, let's say, because we just had that. Um, uh, if it's a construction drawing uh, or a plan of survey or something like that, uh, that they are aware that there's information that will be released to a, to a, uh, a person mm -hmm. um, and protection of their information if it's applicable. Okay. Well, I grew up for the last 60 years with a phone book. It has all yes. that stuff in it. <laughs> yep. It dropped off in the driveway. Yeah. Like, I, I'm having a hard time with like I get the idea of the cyber crimes and stuff, but it, pretty near every place I phone asks me for that, right? Yep. Like, yeah. And so the the impetus there, and same with the phone book, is do you want your information published, right? And that's one of the questions I remember when we had the phone book: is do you want your your information published in the phone book? If not, we won't do it. Uh, it's the same kind of process on Amphibia, which says you know, you know, if you didn't want to give your information out, someone should shouldn't give it out on your behalf. Mm -hmm. I look at Facebook, people are putting their birth dates. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just ridiculous <laughs> when, when you were worried about some stuff and they're giving their fingerprints and their biometrics yeah. to companies they have no idea. I'm, and, just, I'm just trying to rationalize. And so on, on that front too, that's voluntary. Uh, so if you read the Facebook yes. agreements, it's yeah. all it's all <laughs> written right in there. That by accepting you know, Facebook or using that uh, that uh, um, sharing of information, you're also giving up uh, some you know, some uh, personal information as a result too. So. Okay, any other questions? I have one question. Yep. Curator. Sure. So with the, um, is there any consideration to review the fees so it does cover all the costs? We, uh, those are independent. Yeah. So those are really set in the, uh, in the guidance materials and I believe even in regs. Uh, so, uh, so that is something that we can't do. We we definitely do not gain on it. Um, we don't come even. In fact, it's 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 um, if you were to calculate the cost out, it's uh, we might gain like ten percent of of the actual cost of actually processing these. Um, so. I just wonder, just because there seems to be a like you said, there seems to be a wave of this happening more frequently. So I was just yeah. curious if. It was something that was being spoken about regarding because it is it's more it occurs more often than it doesn't now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the act that's all I meant. The act yeah. needs to yeah. change to allow that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and so there's a couple of things that that's based on it. Mel, she uh, she works for those uh, materials quite uh, 
uh, you know, diligently, I would, I would say. And so, uh, so there's a cost for photocopying and there's a cost per page that's generally accepted. Um, and I believe that's built into the regs or the guidance, the guidance and the regs as well. Um, and then there's decisions that have been made that also refine uh, sort of the costs that are applicable. So uh, there's a couple elements there, but there's a, a cost for search of the records um, uh, and there's a cost for, I think, reviewing some of the material, but it's scoped as well. It's like, if you're doing this, it's scoped to uh, a half hour equals this amount. Uh, so it usually doesn't cover off like a base, you know, yeah. like if I'm looking at it, it doesn't come close. It's more like a summer suit, uh, you know, if they were to look at it, which of course you wouldn't use a summer student yeah. for. So, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but there is a, yeah, they have a whole prescribed list of, uh, of fees and, uh, and guidance associated with the whole process, which, uh, um, which is interesting. Um, like I said, it was just more of a general <laughs> question, just because it seems to be happening more frequently. Yeah, something that municipally everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. So yeah. Just something that you know was on somebody's radar to adjust. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, Peter? Uh, through a chair, question to jump out at me: that the uh, application fee for uh, a FOIA request was only five dollars. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 is, is that mandated? Uh, that okay. is the that's written into the the uh, regulation or, or the act. It's like yeah, it should be the regulation, but it's yeah, five dollars to um, put some skin in the game, I guess. Right? Yeah, and that's the initial base fee to make sure it's uh, identified as a as an request and not just anything else. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems kind of low. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jerry. To that point, like I was thinking that myself, they they have to put some minimal point. Yeah. So not everybody's doing it, but you don't want to raise it to a point where it looks like you're deliberately trying to Stop keep it. anybody from yeah. asking yeah, exactly. just because yeah. it's yeah. cost pro prohibitively. Yeah, and I think that's yes. really what they're doing. Yeah. So. Yeah, five dollars is the initial oh. fee, and then what happens is uh, we take a look at the records. We provide a uh, an estimate uh, to to the landowner after that, or you know whoever's requesting the information, uh, and uh, and then at the end of the day we refine it based on uh, based on the actual pages uh, that we do mm -hmm. the actual amount of work. So, okay. Alrighty, can I have a motion to receive the Freedom of Information report, Jerry? Tracy, all in favor? Carrie, great, thank you. Okay, and now we're on 7.6, the CAO report. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so there's a lot in this uh, CAO report and, uh, and you've seen some of the work that we've been doing through uh, uh, some of the corporate service work and uh, the work that, um, that Warren's been doing and uh, he's, he's uh, pretty fantastic. You can see all the, mm -hmm. all the improvements uh, that have been made, uh, no doubt if you're here. Uh, on our Wi-Fi, you're um, you're very grateful um, for for some of those changes. I know we are. Um, you know, even the hubs. Uh, I can't tell you how much that saves in the day, mm -hmm. uh, just by plugging in one cord and dock to the races you are. So instead of plugging four or five and trying to figure out the cords and where they fit in, so um, you know, I've now understood what a C connector is uh, on your computer, which is. Uh, uh, which is like a, a paradise for a computer is really what it means uh, in any user that's trying to use it. So, um, so it's uh, yeah, he's he's been fantastic. Uh, like uh, he's uh, you know we've got a lot a uh, lot of ideas and uh, integrating with a lot of the work that we're doing. So a lot of great work. Um, and uh, and Brett, of course, with the Durham Watershed Planning uh, work that's going on. So. Uh, refining our features, making uh, making information easier to understand, uh, better customer service uh, all around, not just like when you see someone, but also on the back end to make things smoother uh, is something that uh, we as a team want to do and, uh, and are committed to doing it. So I'm glad we're able to highlight uh, uh, some of the work that we've done. And uh, and there's more on the, on the docket uh, uh, to do uh, that. So we're, uh, uh, but of course, before we get to that point, developing work plans and uh, tying up year end has been a big, uh, big focus uh, for the last month. Uh, on the corporate services side, uh, the audit is uh, is a pretty major event for uh, three months, uh, four months or so. Uh, and uh, so we're right in the middle of it uh, right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, carry forwards as well, T4s, um, those sorts of things that are, are done as well on the corporate services side. Uh, communications are, are busy as well. 
and you're reporting on three or four different uh, uh, elements uh, too uh, that we're involved in. Uh, so lots of uh, great things going on. The uh, pay equity and compensation review that is ongoing, we expect that in uh, April, uh, we'll be able to bring it to the board for some uh, consideration. Um, and, uh, and so that's been uh, good working with, uh, with, their, uh, with the team, Pesci and Associates. Um, pronounce that wrong uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it sounds like um, and uh, they've been great to work with um, and John's been uh, doing a fantastic job on, on that and getting it uh, uh, to uh, to a good uh, good point and excited to share that with you um, the another couple of events that we have uh, international plowing matches this year uh, so that's going to be a, a pretty big uh, focus for us so uh, so that's uh, uh, one that uh, we will be leading uh, for for the area. There'll be a number of uh, conservation authorities involved. Uh, so, uh, and that's because international plowing match has uh, a lot of draw for for a lot of areas. So this will be our our uh, chance to shine, I guess you would say, yeah. on, on that end. So uh, so Carolyn Snyder uh, from Christie's Group is is organizing that, uh, and these are it's a pretty big deal uh, as well for for these events. So. I haven't been to one, but uh, everything seems to indicate it's a it's a, it's extremely well attended uh, and lots of great information I shared. So a uh, good opportunity for us to to do that. Um, also wanted to highlight just because it's uh, February, which is uh, traditionally known as some of the bluer days. I think we had uh, a record broken for a uh, number of cloudy days. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was a month where we didn't see the sun. Um, so I uh, so just wanted to uh, highlight uh, some of Christie's work on the forest therapy, which is uh, kind of geared towards um, uh, mental wellness and uh, making sure there's an opportunity. And, and February actually tends to be one of the busiest times for forest therapy, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in the winter time, uh, or less winter, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, one of the busiest times, which uh, might be reflective of just you know people wanting to get out a little bit and uh, an opportunity to do that. So, uh, and uh, just a, a thanks to Ward's lawyers as well for supporting the forest therapy guide uh, or forest therapy uh, sessions in 2023. So, uh, due to their support, we were able to also support the Mental Health Association uh, for about 440, I believe it was. So, um, so that was uh, that's great that we're able to do that. Um, if anyone saw the road, it's in bad shape. Yeah. Um, we can't do anything about it uh, yeah. until there's a thaw. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but do we do have uh, something coming up a little bit later in the capital budget side to uh, to try and figure out what we can actually do with the road uh, and hopefully have something more sustainable than uh, degrading and, and regraveling all the time because it uh, it just seems to disappear uh, into mm -hmm. into the ground um, and pretty quick. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a. Uh, uh, something that we're we're looking at trying to improve. Uh, Colleen, our forester, has done a great job in, in getting all the all the tree planting agreements set up for 2024. So that's fully allocated, which is which is awesome. And uh, and you also see there is a note there. I think a picture as well in the CAO report where it showed the effects of some of the drainage that we're having, um, and that does impact on the field center as well. Uh, we had uh, an event where there was a lot of rain uh, that occurred, and there was some ponding that was occurring right up uh, you know, close to the foundation, so that's uh, not a good long-term uh, uh, situation that we want to be dealing with, so a rain garden will help uh, direct that um, that runoff from the driveway and uh, and also from the field center to create a better solution and something that we can highlight as well um, as a, as a best management practice for, for folks. Um, moving on to uh, the IWM department, um, there's a, there's a lot of work that's going on in terms of lake management planning and uh, some some updates there. Resource management strategy you heard as well. Uh, but a couple of exciting pieces uh, that I highlight in the report is uh, is we received lidar. So as much as Warren was excited about uh, one inch accuracy on our digital elevation, um, this improves our base uh, significantly from what we had before. So we had two meter uh, contours. So I'm about two meters tall. Uh, so that would represent a contour at my foot and at my head. Um, and, uh, and so what we have now with LIDAR from the provincial scoop uh, project that, that occurred is you can divide me into four pieces now. Um, and, uh, and so that's the, the um, kind of contours that, uh, that we have to work with, which means uh, you can get way more detailed uh, digital information across our entire jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, so what that means in the end is we can get better mapping on the regulation side. So 
one aspect that we are uh, we are responsible for from the province is steep slopes, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a critical piece of the steep mm -hmm. slopes is knowing having good contours in order to work that out. And we've noticed, um, based on some field visits, that it's not as accurate as we need it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, so it's tremendous to have that um, that uh, new addition. Uh, there's a, a couple of examples in the in the report as well that in the case of uh, Nancy's team's work on uh, translating our information into something useful mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, so a couple of examples is uh, the water temperature data mm -hmm. and that we've been collecting on uh, for lake man management implementation and that's going in the Fourth Lake Stewards Association mm -hmm. article. Um, and, uh, and so that's uh, great in terms of being able to kind of manage the resource in, in a broader sense. But, uh, you know, from, from anyone that's interested in taking a dip in the lake as well, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, when the temp water temperature is where you want it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you know, it uh, just speaks to you know, information to be used in multiple different ways, depending on what, uh, what, your, what your particular inclination or focus is. Um, and another example is uh, something that we're wrestling with is uh, climate change and the hail event that we had uh, uh, going back uh, November of last year, August of last year, um, is uh, is one that uh, you know impacted our our authority. I think I got a call from Matt uh, that day as he was getting pelted, um, you know, saying, "Hey, there's a you know." Event. There's an event going on, <laughs> um, and uh, and so uh, what we did see is that uh, there was tremendous variability, and this is what we're going to see as we go over time. Is the Climate Change Action Group, which is a volunteer group to collect uh, uh, collect precipitation yeah. samples, um, was analyzed, and you could see the impacts. Uh, so these are all. Um, uh, there's a chart that's identified. There's I believe four or five locations in around Lindsay, and the variance. Uh, in precipitation uh, at different locations was, you know, uh, 30 millimeters difference. Uh, so that's that's a pretty big difference, um, you know, which is a typical rain event. Would uh, you call that the the one the area that had the most uh, rain a uh, um, uh, uh, a river, uh, atmospheric river? I am not a climatologist, so I'd hate to. Um, to delve in it, even though I've taken some climatology courses way mm -hmm. earlier, but we never talked about atmospheric rivers back uh, back mm -hmm. then, um, at least in my courses. So uh, I would hesitate to say when that they way. stall and they just yeah, dump, this one right? this one more moved moved okay uh, very fast. Yeah. Uh, um, certainly is related to uh, what we are seeing though, which is more intense events, and that is something that's been identified in in our climate change. Mm -hmm. um, a strategy and all the documentation out there is we get warmer, wetter, wilder. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a uh, wetter and wilder event mm -hmm. uh, that we dealt with and was evident through, through the monitoring that was, uh, that was produced. So, um, and I think with, uh, with that, um, I'll wrap up my piece on the CEO report. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Through the chair, just one quick question for you on the water temperatures. So the near shore, offshore uh, charting, that kind of struck me. At one point, they must merge. The, 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 yep. What depth are you doing in the offshore? Like, because you go swimming in a lake, it gets colder yep. down. But like, what what are we actually looking at? Yeah. What I'll do is I'll turn it over. No. Okay. That's a good question. I will find out the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but again, <laughs> it, it, it looks impressive, but it doesn't mean much because I don't know. Yeah. I'll find to. out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nancy will find out. I can give you uh, a general. Um, kind of indication of what we're trying to do. Uh, one is, uh, so the near shore is likely on people's docks and the stuff that's in the lake, it'll be out, you know, uh, sampled with a boat uh, mm -hmm. in order to get there. The depth, I'm not too sure about. That's where Nancy will be able to, to mm -hmm. give a little bit of information, but it'd be like near shore um, where the water's shallower, you get the higher temperatures, um, which is where natural cover comes into play. Uh, if you can get more natural cover, it'll probably, you know, it will reduce the, uh, uh, water temperatures, which is good for overall lake mm -hmm. health and uh, some of the species in there. Um, and then we are looking at some other monitoring as well, looking at lake profiling, uh, which I know we've done on Lake Dalrymple, where we actually measure temperature uh, all the way from the surface to the to the uh, uh, sediments. Uh, so, any other questions? Okay, can I have a motion to receive Mark's report, please? Jerry, Kriya, all in favor? Okay, great. So we're on to correspondence 7.7. .7.
thank you. Uh, so correspondence, one item uh, of correspondence uh, received uh, at the time that the agenda went out, at least, uh, which is the MOUs on the region of Durham. So uh, just a, a report indicating that they were supporting um, the agreements and, uh, and a staff report associated with that. Great. So you read that. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Okay. I need a motion for that also. Peter and Jerry, all in favor? Carried. Great. Okay. And right along here. So we're on to 8.1 2024 capital budget and uh, 2024 budget circulation, uh, page 105 to 197. And Jonathan. Up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today we're happy to bring forward the capital budget along with the offering budget, which we have brought forward to uh, the past several meetings. Um, so today, um, the, the main objective and resolution we're seeking towards today is any input on the capital budget, which is new to the board for seeing today, on some critical infrastructure projects that we're looking to move forward with in 2024. We have a number of pressures, as Mark, just, or Mark was mentioning there, we're, um, water pooling towards the field center. We have some internal infra infrastructure to update along with um, at the previous board meeting, we have included in the capital budget, the um, boardwalk, which is grant dependent that uh, Christy is working towards submitting very shortly. Um, so with the capital budget, I included a uh, lead sheet there that kind of goes over the projects that are mainly under Christie's and myself's department. So if you have any specific questions on them, I'm happy to field them. Um, if there's anything that you pulled out at the end of my uh, pre uh, presentation here as well, I included a impact on the continuity of reserves just to provide the board with some direction as to what our reserves look like as of audit 2022. We should have 2023, hopefully in the next four to eight weeks and where um, any of these commitments might put the members um, into the future and the long-term sustainability. I did include a piece there. As you know, we had um, adopted or uh, the board had approved the capital asset management plan in principle. So we are looking to have that phased in starting next year, which will help to support these uh, capital infrastructure demands that are continuing to grow over time. Um, with that being said, the next steps in our budget process um, under the regulation regulations for budget apportionment is that we will have to put the, the budget out to all of our partner municipalities for circulation. And we also have to provide a notice of meeting. And that notice of meeting has to go out 30 days prior um, to the budget coming back to the board of directors. So we're looking to seek the 30 day circulation notice of meeting and consultation simultaneously. And then our March 28th meeting will have the time frame uh, met and the board will be able to uh, do a final budget vote and we'll bring forward any comments if they're received from consultation. Um, with that, I'm happy to receive any questions. Okay, thank you. Jerry. You're the chair. I apologize if you did this last month when I wasn't here, but I was trying to figure out that transitory uh, charges for labor in-house and what that actually meant and how that's going to be implemented. I kind of uh, reluctant to listen to the transitory framework when they talked about inflation uh, being temporary, whatever. I just, could you, if could you highlight, or if you've already done that last month, uh, I'll wait till another time. No, I just want to make sure I'm uh, referencing the same component as you. Well, that, I don't know for, I couldn't give you a point right now. It's just notes that I made. Yeah. If it, I believe is, is it regarding the transitory pieces for the legislation? Yes. Or, yeah. So on that component, we are uh, trying to look for revenue, like how we handled revenues. The way you were, it sounds like the, the, the format's changing, um, how you do oh, the charging. Sorry, yes. Um, so that piece was the actual, um, the prior budgets, we had an operating division and we were able to use in-house expertise to account for staff that are being utilized across different components. So for example, somebody is working on a project specific to one municipality so that they would incur that cost. Now with the changes coming through on the C on the budget enforcement, so that we had category ones, twos, threes, um, general operating and the division of those. Um, and it's just that mechanism we had brought forward to the board for the full uh, cost recovery. I believe it was in September, October, uh, but it's just the way of methodology where we have to allocate staff across the budget. Um, like one person, for example, could be covered through labor and six budgets, for example, whereas before they were housed 
in an offering budget, we were able to kind of charge out to special projects. So a bit of an accounting um, workaround for the new regulations and being a small organization. How do you act? How do you uh, cover people? What the offering? regulations dictated? Yeah, this is the, what the regulations that had us work towards to yep. um, okay. meet the budget requirements. Korea? Um, yes, I'm just looking at the um, capital expenditures and the rain garden project, in addition to the boardwalk project, are both looking for grant funding, I think you said. Um, maybe I missed it. So the rain garden project, how much of that is grant and how much of that is coming from um, capital? The rain garden project, we were looking at. All right, take it. For sure, Christy's on. She did this one, but it's about forty thousand dollars that she's got. The details yeah, it's a, on this. yeah, it's a fifty percent match. Um, the grant would be fifty percent of the overall cost, um, with the remainder coming from. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, thank you. So does this year's um, total, be, especially because of the boardwalk, look much higher than usual? What is it like at the, the bottom? Is eight sixty two. 500. Um, just wondering, is that much higher than the stairs? Um, through the chair, the boardwalk definitely contributes to a large portion of that. And it's just the accumulation of um, there's an investment needed in our, in our infrastructure. Um, field Center is another one. Uh, that rain garden and the field center almost go hand in hand is that rain garden project's really looking to address the water issue that's coming towards the field center. And then the field center projects looking at bring our field center back up to yeah. um, today's standard and do some remediation within there. Um, so I'd say on a compared to prior years, this would be a more capital intensive year. Yeah. Uh, there's also grant dependent projects at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I yeah. appreciate that. I'm just wondering how much, it seems like an extraordinarily large year in terms of things that need to get done. And it's great that they're getting done. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, compared to prior year, I think last year was approximately like $144,000 towards capital assets. Um, and again, the key here is as things are aging, we have to proactively invest and work towards that capital asset management plan. Yeah. So these large shocks are kind of smoothing out over time too, and that there's a consistent funding method. Great. Thank you. Okay. I guess, uh, Christy, I was just wondering, so... Maybe I missed it, but what kind of ideas do we have for the the uh, driveway? So that's actually uh, the actual project this year is to, to look at get an, an expert's appraisal of the of the driveway and of the of the roadway and determine what exactly needs to be done. Yeah, you know, we can sort of sit and guess and and yeah. scratch our heads and think, oh, if we did this, maybe this would work, but. What we really need is for you know a, a professional you know assessment of the road to say these are the things that need to happen, and then from there we'll get an idea from from that report. We'll be able to come back to the board next year with a plan as to how to implement that. As long as we don't pave it. Yeah, I <laughs> drainage tiles. You know, yeah, like maybe get a grant for uh, semi permeable uh, yeah, yeah. paving. Uh, yeah, I I don't know that it, that's a bit of a yeah problem. I We're guess. We're using that drainage tiles in some of our concession <laughs> roads. Yeah, seriously, really, the roads and pull it away. Yeah, it's it's re remove rehab. Move, repair, rehab, and it's uh, it's it's working. Okay, cool. Because I re I remember when we put the the um, uh, you have to pay your parking. That was supposed to go towards the road initially, but well, and yeah. it it continues to go to yeah. the yeah. the upkeep of the road, yeah. but the upkeep of the road just it's the, just, the, it's just the snow plowing. Yeah, I you know dealing with with ice in the winter and then the grading in the summer is you know twenty five thousand dollars a year easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, without even blinking, and that's without a major event. So yeah. and that's to get it to this state. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's going to be um, interesting to see what the solutions yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. I don't. Yeah. Just paving. Paving. Paving isn't going to fix without doing something. <laughs> Construction, like to the to but the paving is something road. you don't probably want to do as a conservation. I thing. <laughs> Just saying, Jerry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just wondering, and maybe taboo, but uh, obviously the base is the problem. The elevation, the finished elevation, would help. 
I don't know if it's conceivable for use people to get involved, but uh, there's a product that comes out of down in Durham region there, the old Lasco steel, they use, uh, it's pulverized um, byproduct of what they have. That's a cheap granular material that drains really well, that doesn't pack down low, but when it's mm -hmm. covered with another material, it makes a really good base, but I don't know if it's something that would be acceptable to this location, but a very cheap product, but basically the only cost is trucking. Mm -hmm. And if you were to scrape one site across and then build up that base mm -hmm. and then take your material back on top and do the other side, if that's a viable option or not. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just noticing here you have a bunch of municipal councillors talking about roads. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. <laughs> and, and we go to Oak I mean, and we have to, so I'm just saying, like, we would probably be more interested in this than you might. Oh, no. And Obviously, we are. <laughs> that's, that's our job. Yeah. Um, do you guys ever go to Okra, Ontario Good Roads Association? No, no why? Lots about it, yeah, I go to Okra sometimes because I, I chair our roads department. So, I mean, you get all sorts of ideas for roads, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But you're right, uh, yeah, roads are important because uh, it gets people places. Um, and uh, and I think you're right, uh, the problem is uh, drainage, uh, base, and elevation, and uh, we have to upgrade. Yeah. yeah, and so those are definitely our challenges. That's right. Okay, any other questions? Road? No, no, no. Okay, so I'm just going to read this. Resolve that the draft 2024 capital budget be updated to reflect any board recommendations prior to circulation and that the draft 2024 capital budget be integrated into the 2024 budget document and that the draft 2024 operating and capital budgets be approved for consultation purposes and that notice of meeting to approve the budget is provided to participating municipalities for March 28th, 2024. So I need a mover and a seconder, Jerry and Peter. All in favor? Carried, great. Okay, so we're on to 8.2, Conservation Authorities Act phase two transition activities. I'm trying to find my spot here. Do but... we have a page number? I thought yes. Was wrong. yes, it's 198. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we skip, sorry, did we, did we skip something? Operating? No. Operating? Well, we just did the budget. No, all... We just did, did capital. Budget. We did capital and operating. Yeah. Uh, yeah they're, all they're all connected there. I guess it's the township. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the phase two transition activities, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, is uh, just an update from where we were uh, from the last meeting. Uh, and I actually have a, an update as well to, uh, to what's in the report. So uh, there is a, uh, of course, the phase two transition activities, which involves the MOUs and uh, sort of access to documents uh, publicly for, for everyone that notice to, uh, uh, to the province and to uh, our municipalities. So uh, since the last report, um, we do have the now signed MOU. I know I said that we were waiting for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I did receive that Friday. So we've got the signed MOU from Durham. Uh, once the budget is approved, of course, we're gonna have to amend the agreements uh, to make sure we have the most current information uh, in there. Um, and, uh, and if, uh, Remember, there's three municipalities that uh, that have the budget inserted as a uh, as an attachment to the agreement. So we'll make sure that's updated, uh, and then following that, uh, our uh, our date for compliance was March 31st. So in, in March, I plan on bringing something forward again that says, you know, it's the 30 days uh, to uh, beyond that that we have to respond back to to the minister and affected parties and make sure that the information is up on the website. So, uh, so that's the time that I'll say, you know, uh, ask for board permission to send a letter to uh, to the ministry saying we're in compliance. So, uh, but just want to give a little bit of room for uh, for some of the processes to uh, to roll through. Uh, so as a result, um, the resolution is really to receive the information. Okay, great. Any questions? Can I have a motion to receive the information, please? Priya, Tracy, all in favor? Carried, great. Okay, and we're on to nine new business uh, CA Act amendments and regulations released by the province. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I sent a note out uh, to everyone identifying uh, that there was a, uh, that the province had released 
uh, the regulation that we've been uh, waiting on for, for some time. Uh, I think it's been maybe a year and a half uh, since they did the public consultation. And so this was um, a decision on the ERL notice. Uh, it wasn't part of the, uh, uh, the recent announcements on the Getting It Done mm -hmm. uh, Act. It's, uh, it was actually uh, part of the ERL notice. So it just mm -hmm. happened to coincide uh, with the same day that uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the other information was announced. Uh, there were two new regulations that were uh, put into place. Uh, one was the kind of big one, uh, which is 4124. Those were the actual words that were tied into what the province was consulting on in relation to our Section 28 uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, they did update the Act as well in several spots uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the regulations uh, that supported piece of the pieces of the Act were, were uh, in play. But in doing so, they also changed a few things around um, mm -hmm. between what was in the regs and what's now in the Act. Um, there is another regulation, and so that was 4124. Uh, 4224, which I looked on that on the EBR web, uh, or sorry, on the Service Ontario website just before the board meeting, and it, it is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but what it did was uh, enabled reporting, uh, it enabled a change to the mandatory services reg. Uh, and one of the clauses in that reg is uh, that, cert, um, that standards can be applied. Uh, by the province uh, in relation to any of the programs that we offer. So this was um, a services standard uh, related to uh, annual reporting uh, relative to more or less CALP timeframes, but the, the guidelines that were now identified in the new regulations. Any? Um, sorry? Any? 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 <laughs> Uh, programs that we do any uh, that is the yeah any program that uh, that we actually uh, do whether it's category one two or three the province can enable standards uh, for each of any of those uh, so in this case what they did do is enable the um, standards related to annual reporting on permitting mm -hmm. uh, and so the permitting functions that were there which that's understandable but, yeah. other but other things do the that we do yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's the amendment that stated that was the standards mm -hmm. yeah. requirements mm -hmm. yeah so, uh, so they've done that, and that's what forty two twenty four was really doing was adding that as a, as one of the mandatory uh, standards for uh, for reporting. Uh, they also enacted Ontario Regulation six eighty eight twenty one, which was kind of held in advance for for a bit, um, and that's related to our section twenty nine uh, stuff. So it's uh, rules of conduct in conservation uh, areas, mm -hmm. and so it uh, produces uh, one regulation. Uh, instead of the 36 that were there before uh, for conservation uh, areas. And same thing with 4124, it replaces all the 36 individual regs, uh, in our case, 18206 with now this 4124. Uh, so we'll all reference the, the same reg. Um, there is an implementation date of April 1st, uh, 2024. Um, and uh, since it is in effect, uh, there is an obligation to make sure that we update all of our material by that date. Um, that's not a reality, uh, realistically. So what we'll do is uh, uh, we're still, I would say, digesting all of the changes. Uh, there's some that are gonna require interpretation. There's no transition policies that were identified by the province. Uh, so those are, are things that we're going to have to uh, wrestle as a, as a group. Um, and what we'll do is we'll prioritize the, the needs based on, uh, you know, if we have regulation items, well, we have to make sure our regulations officers are identified as the, mm -hmm. under the right clauses under the Act for it to be effective. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that we'll, we'll prioritize. Um, you know, the legislation identifies that uh, uh, the kind of text version of of the regulations, so we'll rely on that probably mm -hmm. until we can update the mapping. Um, but also in updating the mapping, there's a requirement that was put in that we need 30 day circulation, so um, before a board meeting uh, in order to have that in place, but that's next week. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a, really isn't any time to, to do that. Um, and, uh, and so there's, uh, there's a lot of things that need to be updated. Uh, there's, of course, implementation policies. Our bylaws need to be updated. Uh, one and two, certainly number two, but definitely number, um, uh, but possibly, sorry, number, number one, which is the general governance bylaw. Uh, there's the transitional procedures are going to have to be worked out. So how, do, how does uh, compliance work when we have um, permits that are out there for you know, anywhere from two to four years or five years uh, in the case of some of the larger ones? and we have a change in regulation, how do we deal with that? Um, especially if some of the areas that we have permits for don't actually meet the reg anymore. 
um, because the uh, one of the changes is reduction in the uh, buffer for wetlands that are either provincially significant or uh, greater than two hectares in size. So that's been smushed down to uh, 30 now for, for all wetlands. Um, and, uh, and so in, in doing that, uh, you know, that is a change in the regulatory scope. But can I just ask a question on that one? Yeah. I mean, in, in a case like that, so let's say you have an agreement with someone who's now keeping that further buffer, that greater buffer. You wouldn't go to them and say, you can inch toward the wetlands. Yeah, go for you it. You wouldn't do that, right? Yeah. I mean, would we... Yeah, it's not so so that's part, but and that's exactly what we have to wrestle with, right? Is I mean, uh, crazy I to say you can now go. Yeah, I would rather say that uh, you have a permit that was issued under law of the day. Yeah, um, yeah. and therefore it's applicable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's something that happened in the past. But what about things that are closer, right? And so you can still apply the same approach, but at some point it doesn't make sense. Certainly April first, it doesn't make sense because at that point we have to. You know, work with the with the new rules, um, but leading up to that, someone legal advice from, in terms of like yeah, because that's a new application that would have those rules. It doesn't necessarily apply to. And, that, and what if that. something was turned down years ago because it didn't, you know, it wasn't within that that distance, and now it is. So well, could they come forward and come yeah, yeah, it come is back. possible. Um, reapply, 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 reapply yeah. Oh yeah, to look at but, it. Yeah. And, yeah, but I know that, uh, and I've done the research on this historically because uh, this is some of the prep that we we're doing when the consultation was going on, uh, is that we have not really refused any permit. Um, so either applications were withdrawn by the applicant because the um, the uh, cost involved in doing the studies proved that it wasn't mm -hmm. going to cause an adverse effect uh, or something that were probably not anticipated mm -hmm. uh, at the time that they were proposing something. Um, uh, or uh, the board has decided to move forward with those applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so there, there's only been one instance I can remember in less maybe 15 years uh, where something was was refused. Uh, so, so the the number of permit applications that are actually refused are pretty pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so. Um, there, there's a couple other pieces, of course, uh, because it references a different uh, piece of uh, legislation now, uh, we have to update every single piece of correspondence that we have, um, So, uh, which includes a website, um, any letters that, uh, that go out reference a different piece, the templates that we base our, our permits on, um, you know, anything that, uh, that references. Talk about an FOI. We should be charging the province for all the time that's anyway. Yeah, it'd be yeah. nice if there was some support for it. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, well, I'm glad that uh, Conservation Ontario is, uh, is going to help out in some of the model uh, transitions. Uh, uh, the CAO there is a lawyer as well, and uh, I know that uh, they do a pretty good job of creating some, some model yeah. um, kind of information that we can rely on. And, uh, and so I think that's going to be pretty important as yeah. we kind of wrestle our way through, but um, but it has to kind of work for, for us as well. Uh, of course, we have our mapping uh, updates as well, and then uh, communication uh, going out to our affected parties as well. So, uh, so there's a lot. Uh, there is a good news story in here as well, which is, uh, uh, and I suppose I should say, I'm not suggesting that is in there is not a good news story. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, we have stop work order abilities uh, now that's been in. Uh, well, we wanted that for ages. Yeah. That's yes. big. So, yeah. so that yeah. is pretty big. I know yeah. the province was a little bit hesitant, uh, you know, as they're going through the process. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to be uh, kind of careful in how we how we apply it and make sure that we have the appropriate mm -hmm. training and, and uh, yeah. hopefully the ministry will be involved in in uh, some of their um their guidance on, on that end, but, uh, but that is something that's in there. Uh, there is also the other uh, piece which needs an enacting reg before it can be implemented, but they've kept in, which I know there are a lot of comments against, but uh, they've kept in the, if you get a planning act approval, then you might get a permit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's essentially your permit from the conservation authority. Uh, there is a caveat in there, which is good because the caveat says, unless it doesn't address all the natural hazards, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it is a little bit sloppy, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. And then I, I do have questions about how that translates to a permit because mm -hmm. there's no conditions necessarily attached to mm -hmm. a planning comment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so we'll either have to be much more rigorous in our planning comments mm -hmm. um, or we'll have to use that other clause that says, you know, it doesn't really address the things that mm -hmm. uh, need to be addressed on a site scale as you're doing the work because uh, we don't comment on sill fences, mm -hmm. um, you know, in 
most uh, most things that we see, unless it's a pretty major development mm. uh, where there's a sediment erosion control plan that's uh, identified and reviewed as part of the process. So, so we'll have to navigate that mm. when it does come out, but at least that's further down the road. Okay. Um, what else? There's of course some uh, clarifications or exemptions now in the act. Uh, there were not exemptions in the previous uh, regulations. Uh, so those are some things that we'll have to work uh, with. And I can honestly say, I don't understand a couple of them right mm -hmm. now. Um, partly it's uh, not uh, part of the business that we're like involved in on a daily basis, but, uh, but these the words um, need a little bit more clarification from at least my standpoint. Uh, and those are related to agricultural type activities. Uh, so, and it does involve like tile draining was, uh, was one of those pieces. So um, uh, there is, um, a number of appeal mechanisms now as well that we'll have to kind of sort through. Mm -hmm. uh, appeals on conditions, fees, uh, complete application requirements, um, and uh, and then some further appeals to the minister and uh, OLT as well in that were mm -hmm. uh, enacted. We, we knew about those beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, more or less, um, but, uh, but those are ones that we're going to have to build processes into. Uh, tied in with that was additional delegation powers mm. uh, and timelines to deal with some things uh, as well. So uh, so there have to be some discussions on uh, delegation um, of uh, not only issuing permits, but there's a potential for canceling permits as well now uh, that could be uh, designated to uh, a staff person or other body. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, a new, new piece as well in the, uh, in the regulations that have been enabled. Wow. Um, calc timelines, so uh, there's a few mentions of uh, timelines now. Uh, so responding to uh, pre-consultations within a certain amount of period of time, 21 days, I believe. Um, there is the uh, uh, need to make a decision within 90 days mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and an appeal does not constitute part of like stopping the clock. So that's, that's a lot of the conversation yeah. that we've had is, well, what if the, you know, what if there's an additional process we don't get all the information that we, yeah. you know, we usually stop the clock right now. So uh, we'll have to work out some processes to, to manage that. Um, and there is a, another requirement when we identify a complete application, we can't ask for anything more. So uh, we either have to ask for it up front uh -huh. um, or uh, we have to find another way of getting the answers. Uh -huh. uh, so Is it possible to get a Coles note version of all these changes? There, so we yeah. have them. Yeah. Um, so it can kind of ruminate on all, yeah. the, all of this. It's very interesting, but it's... Yeah. It's uh, overwhelming. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a cool version, well, but I'll but, do my best. But just, yeah, to you explained it very well, but just it, yeah. just to have it, you know, yeah. so we yeah. know what Is all there the a document that Conservation Ontario created. Well, that's true too. Uh, they they are, are uh, in the same state that we are. Um, I Once it's all finished, ahead of the curve, yeah. but uh, but uh, you know, no one's seen the reg until just Friday. Right. Uh, so when so when you have all that, reading. yeah, uh, I did spend a portion of the weekend reading, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but not the whole weekend. A little uh, light reading. Oh my yeah. goodness! But there's there's a lot of pieces to kind of sort out. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, I can give a close notes version at the next board meeting. I plan to do a, a just so we have well, not necessarily doing it again, but just you know, so we have a piece that we can keep yep. to to have a look at. Yep. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, other than that, there's there's more in there um, as well. A couple of new tests that were added um, that we'll have to explore a little bit. Um, and a couple that were removed. Uh, pollution and conservation land were removed, yeah. uh, which we kind of knew about too, but that might have implications again on, on our policies uh, that we have in play for, for development. And certainly mm -hmm. uh, the... Um, the reduction in the area of interference does affect our... Um, development policies as well. So we know we had to update that. I think we're really going to have to uh, update that uh, uh, with more rigor, I think, because some some policies will be a little bit difficult to uh, to implement mm -hmm. based on what we have. So. Well, Anyways, there's, there's a lot. It'll be a Stay tuned. Busy, <laughs> busy year. Um, yeah. And we'll kind of chart a course forward and, yeah. and some things will come a little bit quicker than some other things, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to try and get to... Uh, compliant um, framework, uh, hopefully within the year. Great. Okay. So um, that was just inf information. We don't need a, um, to have a resolution on that. So uh, 
reports and updates from board members. Kriya, do you have anything that you want to share? Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Didn't okay. think about that ahead of time. I, I should. No, that's okay. Cherry? I don't think so at the moment. Thanks. Peter? Yeah, uh, Chair Warren uh, touched on it just before our meeting is that uh, Portal Land Trust has purchased 1,400 acres in Trent Lake and the southern end of the municipality on Pigeon Lake. So oh, wow. it's pretty exciting. And uh, they're trying to get in, uh, ideas from the public on how of what they can do with this land. The provincial government uh, contributed 2.9 million. At the purchase price for it was in around $8 million. And what we didn't hear was the feds kicked in seven million. Okay. Oh, wow. So I don't know if there's going to be an, another big announcement or whatever, <laughs> but that's that's what I've heard. So yeah, yeah wow. it's really super exciting. And yeah. and just, that's what I was gonna, just uh, on what Peter's saying, that Mark and I were, were there and it was, it was uh, incredible because there are buildings on this piece of land also. Um, and there's a, a really old building that, um, I guess was it a lord or somebody? Yeah, it was Lord like a, Camp, I lord, think. Yeah. Um, and uh, used to uh, um, have uh, uh, dignitaries come to visit. It, you walk in, and the, it's a, a beautiful inside. It's clapboard outside. I thought it would mm -hmm. be something yeah. different, but inside, it's quite something. And big, huge stone fireplace and. It's uh, so at first they thought they were going to have to, oh my God, take it down. And the cost to do that would have been just incredible. So they've decided to, to keep it. And so I guess they'd have to fundraise for that. But, uh, and then there's uh, another building that's a log building. That's where we were at and it's in pretty good shape. Um, and I believe there are some other buildings there yeah, too. There's a couple of yeah. So it's, it's quite an exciting uh purchase for sure anyway yeah what um what type of land is it like is it forest covered land is it yeah. uh, pasture conservation it, it, land it and waterfront yeah. so you have boyd island over here and then you from here the, the hammer property it's called you can see boyd island so Cortha land trust has this 1400 acres and then I'm not sure how many acres on Boyd Island, but it's it's almost most of Boyd Island. I think they kept two or three lots. Yeah, so it's like most of it, but it's it's just it's it's incredible. So they can you know offer kayaking and canoeing and and uh, yeah, so they're reaching out to the public to see. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. Thanks, Peter. Tracy, do you have anything to share? I don't. Oh, okay, Carol. Well, I think all's calm in Skewa. <laughs> it's as calm as it ever gets. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just going to share the the Hammer property, which is mm -hmm. it was just it was so exciting. Yeah. Thank well, you. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I guess that's uh, the end of our open session. So. Okay, so we uh, need a motion um, to enter uh, into, for the board to enter into closed session. Okay, Jerry? Yeah. Peter, all in favor? Carrie. And, uh, Madam Chair, for the first one, uh, if not, and I believe our regulations officer is uh, 